sound of heaven Can you hear the angel's song Calling us into his presence Drawing us to sing
There's no one as worthy as you, Lord. We just relish in your presence. And we enthrone you above every other name, above every other God. You're the only one who is worthy of our adoration, of our praise, of our worship. Receive it tonight, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen, guys. We can head back to our seats. Can we give a shout to Jesus as we head back? Oh, my goodness. Worship is just incredible. Shout out to this incredible band, Sagrada and Music. I honor you. <laughs> oh, my goodness, guys. Welcome to Monday night. I am so excited for tonight because one of my, I know we shouldn't have favorites, but I have a favorite preacher and he's preaching tonight. Um, <laughs> Um, I can actually jump into announcements as we head back to our seats. If you are looking for a seat um, and if there's an empty one next to you, just raise your hand. Um, yeah, amazing, perfect. My name's Moda, I mentioned it in the beginning, but I'm a part of the Circuit Rider team here and this is our weekly night of worship and um, preaching from all across, people from all across Orange County come here. We unify around the name Jesus and we just are blown away by what God is doing in our generation. Um, Lindy Kofer just came out with an amazing, amazing, amazing album. I had this, I'm, I'm writing papers right now, and I had the album playing in the background the whole weekend, all my life. I don't know where the slides are, but um, all my life is out now everywhere. And um, please listen to it. If you actually have your phone, if you go to Spotify. Oh, you have a video. Oh, guys, we have a video. That's way better than me talking about it. Okay, cue the video. I'm like getting emotional watching all those clips. That time when we did the live recording was such a special time for our community. And this album really is an offering of our praise and adoration to Jesus. If you are on any streaming platform, you will find all the songs there. But we also have another exciting announcement. Circuit Riders, if you don't know us by now, we are passionate about developing leaders for the kingdom. And one of my favorite things that we do is Circuit Rider Schools every summer. We have locations all across Orange County, not all across, in Orange County, Paris, France, and in Finland, hello, how cool. Um, but if you have a desire in your heart to be developed as a leader who actually has a revelation of the gospel and recognizes that you can, you can step into any sphere of society as an agent of change, as a kingdom mover and shaker, please pull out your phone and um, um, scan the QR code to, put an, to send in an application to join us here in Orange County for our Circuit Rider School, but also Paris is fire. We're doing an Olympic outreach, guys. The school is actually three days, and then the, the remaining seven days, we're gonna be doing an evangelistic outreach with the YWAM base in Paris, preaching the gospel while people from all across the world are there for the Olympics. That is exciting. So I don't even think I need to say any more, anything else, but I'm gonna just go ahead and invite Zach Nash up. <laughs> Take it away. What's up, Monday night? Let me get ready real quick. 
go get ready. I'm not going to lie, guys. I got to follow Sam Storms and Michael Culliano, so I'm a little. Thank you, thank you. Who was here last week for Michael Culliano's? Unbelievable. Such an incredible, uh, incredible night. Such a gift to have him and both Sam Storms with us. You guys doing good? How are you guys in the balcony doing up there? Let's go. Well, I'm excited. Tonight's going to be fun. I, um, I just got back from Finland last night. So, f- yep, I flew out um, last Thursday, got there Friday night, preached on Saturday, and came back yesterday so I could be here tonight. Love our Monday nights. But it was really special um, because there's a youth movement happening in Finland. Like, it's... It's incredible. There was, on Saturday, 1,200 young people from all across Finland gathered together. And um, it was such an honor to be able to be there, preach the gospel in that setting. And 117 young people flooded the front to receive Jesus. They were coming up in tears, getting washed by the blood of Jesus. And it was, uh, it was a moment. It was incredible. And so I'm a little bit kind of living in that moment. So we'll see if I can get through everything we want to get through tonight. But I just, I was realizing that if you preach Jesus, people get saved. Because he saves people. And the gospel actually works. It truly does save souls. His blood really does forgive and cleanse us of all sin. Uh, And there is no good news apart from Jesus. And so uh, as I was there, it was incredible thinking about the scripture where it says that he's the desire of the nations, that the nations actually are longing for King Jesus. So my prayer, uh, as I saw those those locations, I'm praying that some of you would go to Finland for the CR school. Some of you should go to Europe for the CR school. Some of you, I just feel the Lord might be calling some of you to the nations. So you should go, you should check it out. It would be amazing. Okay. You guys ready to jump in tonight? All right. We've been going through uh, our series in Acts. Last week, we kind of let Michael Culianos do what he does, preach Jesus. It was amazing. And uh, so we're going to jump in tonight. If you want to turn to Acts chapter 9, we're going to read verse 1 through 9. And uh, we're going to build this out tonight. I think it's going to encourage you, challenge you, uh, and myself. And so uh, I'm going to read it to you. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. says this, But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, which would be followers of Jesus, men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground And although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Father, we pray tonight that you would illuminate your word to us, that you would open up our hearts, our spirits to receive revelation from you tonight. Holy Spirit, speak to us. We long to encounter Jesus tonight. We long to be changed through your word. So come, Holy Spirit, do what you do best. Reveal Jesus to us. Change us from the inside out, we pray in Jesus' name. So we're going to talk a little bit about Saul or Paul. Um, I'll use his name interchangeably depending on what we're reading in the text. Saul and Paul, he had two names. Saul being his Jewish name, his Hebrew name, Paul being his Greek name. So it wasn't like he wasn't ever called Paul and all of a sudden Saul became Paul and was no longer Saul. He had two names that were used interchangeably, so um, I'll use his name that way tonight. But before we get into his life and kind of dissect this this pivotal moment, um, we need to understand what the context was. you got to understand 
like, do you realize how much of the New Testament Paul wrote? Like, a lot. <laughs> so many of, so many books of the New Testament, the letters are the writings of Paul. So for us, it would probably be insightful to know who was this man that we're reading? Who was he? What was he like? What, how did he get to where he got to? How, how was it that he had this revelation? And so um, I want you to, you can, you don't have to read it, but uh, in chapter 6 and 7, we read about this man named Stephen. Everybody say Stephen. And Luke tells us that Stephen uh, was full of grace and power. Wouldn't you love for that to be said of you? Full of grace and power. And he was doing great work, uh, great wonders and signs among the people. And some of the leaders, some of the Jewish leaders in the synagogue, they were arguing and disputing with Stephen. And it says that they were unable, check this out, they were unable to withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So that gives you an idea of what Stephen was like. And so they began to, they, they made this lie up and they were telling people that Stephen was blaspheming Moses and the elders and scribes seized him and they brought him before the council. So Stephen was preaching um, that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So he was the fulfillment of the temple and the law, but they rejected his message. And they accused him of saying that Jesus was going to destroy the temple. He was going to change what Moses had given him. And so the high priest asked him if this is true, and Stephen launches into a sermon. And in his sermon, he lays out four key moments or people in the history of Israel. You tracking with me? This is in Acts chapter 6 and 7. He lays out, talks about Abraham, he talks about Joseph, he talks about Moses, and he talks about David and Solomon. And here's what he does. He brings a common thread throughout this sermon that God is not uh, limited to one specific place or location. I'm going to read you a few verses out of Acts uh, chapter 7, uh, verses 48 through 50. He says, The Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and the earth my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all of these things? Acts 7, 51 through 53. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Acts 7, 54 through 60. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. Talk about manifestation. But he, Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. We always read about Jesus being seated at the right hand of the Father. But in this moment, he stood up. He stood up when Stephen was in this moment and he sees him. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees with a loud voice, he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This brings us to Acts chapter 8, verse 1. It says that Saul approved of his execution. He approved of his execution. So who was Saul, who was this man? Can I read you a couple more Bible verses? Are you okay if we go through the scriptures tonight? 
So this is, this is his own words about his life, okay? This is in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. Paul says, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. And in Acts 22, 3 through 5, Paul says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death. Binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take also those who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem and be punished. So that's who he was. That's what's happening. He's on his way. He's on the road to Damascus and he's going to find these people who were a part of the way and he's looking to bring them bound to Jerusalem he was persecuting the church violently he said I was zealous for the tradition of my fathers and N.T. Wright and his he wrote, wrote a biography on Paul he makes this really helpful correlation between Paul and Elijah and I think it's really helpful to understand you know Elijah right he was the prophet in the Old Testament and he was zealous for the God of Israel. We, we know the stories of Elijah. He had this zeal, and he remember the story where he calls down fire on the prophets of Baal. Do you remember that? He was ridding Israel of idolatry. He was zealous for, for God and the purposes of God. Saul was zealous, that same type of zeal, for the traditions of his father. He viewed the way, or Christians, those following Jesus, he viewed them as opposing the God of Israel and the plan of the God of Israel. Because in his mind, and in that kind of current Jewish mindset, a Messiah would never die on a cross. The Messiah would be blessed by God. So if, if this so-called Messiah died a criminal's death hanging on a tree, there's no way he's actually the Messiah. So Paul was persecuting the church, anything that he felt was standing in the way of God's plan, the God of Israel, his plan, he wanted to remove it. And so that was his zeal. That's what he was zealous for. It was the traditions of his father. And as we look back uh, at our original text in Acts chapter 9, we see this zealous destroyer of the church headed to Damascus. And this is what happens. Falling to the ground, we read it already, I'm going to read it again. He heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, he said. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Rise, enter the city, you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, his eyes were opened, but he saw nothing. They led him by the hand, brought him to Damascus, and for three days he was with it, without sight. He neither ate nor drank. Paul, or Saul, on his road to Damascus, has a head-on collision with grace. It's a head-on collision. The zealous one, after the tradition of his fathers, this Hebrew of Hebrews, this Pharisee who was a persecutor of the church, who was persecuting Jesus himself as he's on the way, boom, head-on collision with grace himself. And he's knocked to the ground and he's blinded. He can see nothing and he's taken uh, to the city and it says for three days he was without sight, he neither ate nor drank. And Tim Keller makes this uh, interesting point that I, I, really, um, I really think it's true. He makes this point, he because the question is, why did Paul, why, why was Saul blind? Why did Paul, why couldn't he see for, for those days? What, what happened? Why did he not eat? Why did he not drink? What was occurring in this moment? And Tim Keller makes this point, and he said this, 
Saul not being able to see and not being able to eat or drink was only left with his thoughts. All he could do was think. And you see, when you have a head-on collision with grace himself, the person of Jesus, it forces you to rethink everything. You see, who, if you were here for Michael Koulianos last week, raise your hand. I just want to see who all was here. Amazing. If your life didn't look more like Jesus over the last week, then you should really rethink things. Because we had an encounter with Jesus. It was a moment. And so our encounters with the person of grace, Jesus himself, should force us to rethink everything about life if he is truly who he says he is. You see, Paul, or Saul, he was very well educated. He understood the, you know, he would have been very well versed in the first five books of the Bible. He, he understood the history of Israel. He was zealous for tradition. But in that moment of darkness, all he could do was think because he's realizing, oh my word, the one who, who I am opposing is actually the God of Israel in the flesh. I thought he was opposing God, but in fact, I'm opposing God. I am not just persecuting a people, I am persecuting Jesus. And so Paul is forced in this moment to rethink everything. I want to propose to you, there's a story in Luke 24, 13 through, through uh, 32. Can I read you this Bible story? You okay if we do some scripture reading? Keep going here. You'll know this story. Luke 24, 13 through 32. It says, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. And about seven miles from Jerusalem, they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. That was that the Jesus had been crucified. They were talking about this. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with him. Went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them uh, named Cleop Cleopas uh, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to condemn him to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things had happened. Moreover, some of the women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and they did what, And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Talk about a Bible study. Jesus teaching you the scriptures. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at a table with them, he took the bread, he blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight, and they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I want to propose to you that in those three days of darkness where Saul was blinded, 
Maybe he was having his own road to Emmaus moment. The road to Damascus turned into the road to Emmaus. And all of a sudden, Jesus began teaching him all those scriptures he was well versed in. Can you imagine? He knew them backwards and forwards. He's blinded. He's not eating. He's not drinking. He can't see. But all of a sudden, head on collision with grace. And now Jesus is giving him a Bible study throughout the scriptures. And he's forcing him to rethink everything. You see, his eyes couldn't see. And his stomach was empty. But don't you think his heart began to burn? Don't you think in those three days something happened in the life of Saul? If you were here last week, you heard Michael read out the different ways that Jesus was seen throughout the Old Testament. I'm not going to repeat him. I'm going to read you what John Calvin wrote. He said, he Christ is Isaac. This is something like what could have been happening to Paul. He's the beloved son of the father who was offered as a sacrifice, but nevertheless did not succumb to the power of death. He is Jacob, the watchful shepherd, who has such great care for the sheep which he guards. He is the good and compassionate brother Joseph, who in his glory was not ashamed to acknowledge his brothers, however lowly and abject their condition. He is the great sacrificer sacrificer and bishop Melchizedek, who was offered an eternal sacrifice once, And for all, he is the sovereign lawgiver, Moses, writing his law on the tables, tablets of our hearts by his spirit. He is the faithful captain and guide, Joshua, to lead us to the promised land. He is the victorious and noble King David, bringing by his hand all rebellious power to subjection. He is the magnificent and triumphant King Solomon, governing governing his kingdom in peace and prosperity. He is the strong and powerful Samson who by his death has overwhelmed his enemies. The list goes on and on. Don't you think Jesus was teaching Paul something like this? He couldn't see. He was empty in the stomach, but his heart was burning. Something was coming alive. In verse 23, it said that when many days had passed, He went back to Jerusalem, and those many days is actually clarified in Galatians 4. Galatians 1, 15 through 17. This is what those many days are referencing. It says, Paul wrote, When he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia, follow me on this, I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Saul came back to Damascus. There's this another correlation between Saul or Paul and Elijah. In 1 Kings 19.8, we read that Elijah goes to Horeb. It was the Mount of God. And while he was there, he has an encounter with the Lord, and the Lord speaks to him. And one of the things that the Lord tells Elijah is that he is to return to Damascus and anoint a new king. Arabia was where the mountain of God was. That would have been where Mount Horeb was, the mountain of God. Paul went away to Arabia, and he came back proclaiming a new king. King Jesus. You see, everything changed for Saul. Everything had to be rethought. He had to rewire his framework because with the arrival of Jesus, check this out, came the arrival of the kingdom. And here's what the kingdom is. You ready? The kingdom is an entirely new way of thinking and living. It's like a completely new operating system. So with Jesus came the arrival of the kingdom. And see, this kingdom was not just something that was far off and in the future. It had immediate impact on life here and now. That's why Jesus said the kingdom is what? At hand, within reach. You can touch it. 
you can feel it. It's here. And it has massive implications on your life. It came bursting on the scene through Jesus Christ. And so here was the message of the kingdom. You ready? The message of the kingdom was this. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repentance is this. Change your mind. Change the way you think about everything. That's what repentance is. That's what was happening in those moments with Saul. It was a deep work of a pent- repentance. You see, you can't, you can't separate repent and believe because repentance is that turning from and the belief is turning to. Change the way you think about everything and look at me. Look at me. So what we wanna, I want to dig into tonight is that we've got to change the way we think. You and I need an upgrade in our thinking. We need an upgrade in our thinking. Everything starts with thoughts. And we're going we're gonna to get into that. Romans 8, 5 through 6 says this. For those who live according to the flesh, check this out, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the world, but what? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What you think about matters. What you set your mind on matters. It actually determines how you live. That's why Saul had to spend those days not being distracted by anything else. He had to be put in this place of darkness to retrain his mind, to renew his mind. It was like, Saul, I've got to start thinking differently now that Christ has come. Can I tell you one of the most transformative seasons of my life? I've shared my story plenty of times. I, most of you know I came from a, a background of drug addiction for about five years. It was pretty bad, uh, intense addiction. Couldn't get free. Tried everything. Tried different medication. Tried going to meetings. Tried moving away. Tried doing all the stuff in the natural I could do. Nothing worked. And it was when I went away for a year to a program called Teen Challenge. And it was in that year... One, that I really encountered the Holy Spirit. But two, my mind started getting renewed because all I could do, I, didn't have, I couldn't have a phone. I had one four-minute phone call a week on Saturdays. I got a four-minute phone call. They timed me, and then I had to hang up when the four minutes was up. You couldn't watch. There was no TV. I had no phone. I couldn't get books. Only books I could get were uh, Christian books that they permitted us to have. But mainly all I could do was read the Bible. So almost for a year, all I did was have consistent time in the scriptures, and every day we had 30 minutes of prayer. Every day for a year. I was immersed in the scripture, and I was in prayer at least 30 minutes a day. It was the most transformative time of my life. Absolutely changed everything to the point where I never went back to any addiction. I never went back to drug use. I never went back to the old way of living. I never went back to old relationships. It was because the scriptures began to retrain my thinking and prayer began to change my heart. Sometimes we're always looking for this new way of breakthrough. Can I tell you that the ancient way is the way? Meditation on scriptures and prayer. It changes everything. So that's how we get transformed. Reading the scriptures. That's what Michael really charged us on last week. Don't scroll so much. Look at this scroll, right? Look at this word. Dig into this book. When you're tempted to scroll, pull out the ultimate scroll. (laughs) Hallelujah. So we got to change our thinking because, see, often here's we uh, are big on freedom. We love freedom. And if you've been here when we went through our freedom series, we talked about strongholds. 
and we love teaching on how strongholds are formed. Track, track with me. By our thoughts, we make decisions. And our decisions then turn into values. And our values become our lifestyle. And then a lifestyle in the teaching of strongholds lead us into bondage. That's how, that's how the strongholds are built. But if we can be bound to the enemy, but Paul says that he was a prisoner to Christ, that he became a love slave to Jesus. So we can become in bondage to him in the same way when our thoughts begin to change about who he is. All of a sudden, our, our decisions and our actions change, so do our values our lifestyle changes, and all of a sudden, instead of building negative strongholds in our life, we cling to the best stronghold, King Jesus. You see, we got to change the way we think. Often, we want to change our lifestyle. We get tired of the behaviors, right, that we're going through. We get, we get frustrated that we keep making mistakes. We get frustrated that we keep getting angry. We get frustrated in all these different areas, and we try to do this kind of behavior modification, and it never works because we never get to the root problem that we've believed lies. Our thought life needs to change. And so I want to I lay out for us three major changes that we need to make in the way we think. Does that sound good? So here's number one. One of the most important, if not the most important thing we need to change in the way we think is we need to change how we think about God. That's what happened to Paul. That's what was happening to him in that moment. He had to rethink everything now that Christ actually became real to him and he realized this is the Messiah. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 says this. Long ago... At many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. The eternal word of the father is Jesus. The message has never changed. He appointed him as the heir of all things to whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of of his nature, Colossians 1, 15. He is the image of the invisible God. If your view of the Father is not in alignment with the person of Jesus, you need to change the way you think about the Father. You have to let the person of Jesus determine your view of God because he is God in the flesh. John told us that no one has ever seen God except he who was at the right hand of the Father. He has revealed him to us. Meaning you can't actually know the Father apart from Jesus. We will make up all these misconceptions and we will project our own fear onto the face of the Father. We will, we will allow what we go through in our earthly examples, we will use those to try to paint a picture of what the Father is actually like. And what the scriptures tell us is that the Father looks just like Jesus hanging on a tree. That's what the Father looks like. Because Jesus wasn't trying to convince the Father to love you by dying. It wasn't that God was so mad at you that Jesus said, I'm going to have to go, die on the cross, and try to convince my Father to forgive and love them. That's not the heart of the Father. There was no convincing the Father. He's trying to convince us, this is what my Father's like. The cross didn't change the Father, it changed you and me. That was the fullest expression of the heart of the Father, was His bleeding Son on a tree. See, we got to change the way we think about God. He is the image of the invisible God. There was this group that we all have heard of called the Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And theologians say that the Pharisees, what they did is they would hide the keys of the kingdom from people. Meaning they would make it so difficult for people. They were so exclusive. <clears throat> One commentator says that the Pharisees operated carefully controlled table fellowships that excluded those who would not or could not fit in with their pursuit of holiness. Even when Jesus was invited to and attended meals with Pharisees, 
he would create embarrassment by what he said and did. But what was worse was that Jesus deliberately, hear this, cultivated close social relationships with precisely those groups of people whom the Pharisaic program excluded. Sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes. By eating with, with them, Jesus was including them in his vision of God's kingdom. And he was showing that the kingdom of God was all about grace and mercy and forgiveness, not about exclusion. That's why in the face of the Pharisees when they came to him, that's why that Luke 15 parable, those parables are so amazing. He's looking in the face of angry Pharisees who are mad that he's hanging out with sinners. And he says, let me tell you what my father's like. He's like the shepherd who leaves the flock for the one. He's like the woman who searches the house because she lost one coin. He's like the father whose son basically said, I want you, you're dead to me. Give me my inheritance. And he goes and he wastes everything. Jesus is saying, my father is like that father who waited on the porch day and night. And when he finally sees his wayward son, he doesn't wait for him to come back and give him this epic speech. He takes off dead sprint and embraces him and puts the ring and the robe around him. He gave him his own robe of righteousness and he reinstates him back into the inheritance of the family. He's saying that is what my father is like. The throne upon which Jesus sits is a throne of grace where we find mercy. Jesus is all about mercy. The father is all about mercy. What was happening in Saul's life and in Paul's life in those days of darkness, I also believe that as he was having a revelation of the mercy of God, his zeal was being redirected. He was zealous for the tradition of his fathers, all of a sudden, head-on collision with grace, and then boom, his zeal gets redirected towards mercy. That's why his motto when he would write his letters, what would he say? Grace and peace. The destroyer of the church who was violently persecuting the way, now his motto is grace and peace. You see, Jesus makes us rethink everything. Our definition of God cannot come through culture or our own thoughts. It has to come through looking at the crucified one. Galatians 1, 11 and 12, Paul says, For I would, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Man does not bring definition to the gospel. Jesus defines the gospel. Jesus is the gospel. He is the message. So that's number one. We've got to change the way we think about God. How do we do that? We immerse ourselves in the book. You've got to immerse yourself in the book. You've got to let this thing, these words, renew your mind. You see, the world wants you to conform to its ways. Jesus wants this thing to govern your thought life. That's what that means when you set your mind on the Spirit. It means that your mind is governed by the Spirit. Who wrote the book? People did, but who wrote the book through the people? The Holy Spirit. So we get our mind governed by the Spirit by ingesting this Word. Day and night, meditating on it, letting it cleanse our thoughts, change the way we think. So number one got to change the way we think about God. Number two, we got to change the way we think about ourselves. Come on, you got to change the way you think in light of Him. Because if He is Lord of all creation, if everything that was made was what made by Him, through Him, and for Him, if He knit you together in your mother's womb, if he was the reason of your creation, then what he says about you matters, than what, matters more than what you feel about yourself. What he says about you 
has way more weight and value than what those around you or those who you brought up around said about you, whether good or bad. The way he speaks about you and the way he sees you has more weight and value than that sports coach who used to beat you down or that teacher who said you were never smart or that friend who was always jealous and always made fun of you and was always bitter. His opinion of you matters more than anything. And so we got to rethink who we are in light of his coming. I think it was maybe six months ago on a Monday night. I read through these, but I felt to do it again tonight. I want to read to you who you were before Christ and who you are now that he's come. You're not going to get all these verses written down, so don't try. But you can try. But I want you, just to, re- I want you to receive this, okay? I want you to receive this. There's an impartation in this. This is who you were before Christ. You were spiritually dead, Ephesians 2.1. You were ungodly, Romans 5.6. You were without strength, Romans 5, 6. You had no relationship with God, Ephesians 2. You were without Christ, Ephesians 2. You were condemned, Romans 3. You were guilty, Ephesians 2. You were a child of wrath, Ephesians 2. You were in darkness, Ephesians 5, 8. You were banished, Genesis 3, 23 through 24. You were under the power of sin, Romans 5, 6. You were separated from God, Genesis 3. You were, you had uh, been, you were, Dead in trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2, 1. You are a sinner, Romans 5, 10. You are an enemy of God, Romans 5, 10. You had no mercy, 1 Peter 2, 10. You had no hope or peace, Ephesians 2, 12 through 5. That's a discouraging list. Can I tell you who you are now that Christ has come? Yeah. Now that you are born again, you have to start thinking born again. You have to think born again. You have to think kingdom. You've got to think see, saved you got to be a believer, okay? Here's who you are now that Christ has come, and if you're born again, you are now spiritually alive, John 3, 1 through 21. You are a holy priest, 1 Peter 2, 9. You are kept by the power of God, 1 Peter 1, 5. You are an heir and joint heir, Romans 8, 16. You are in Christ, Ephesians 2. You are justified, Romans 5. You are pardoned, Romans 6. You are a child of God, John 1. You are light, Ephesians 5, 8. You are accepted, Ephesians 1. You are freed from the power of sin, Romans 6. You are joined to God, Ephesians 2. You are made alive in Christ, Ephesians 2. You are a saint, Ephesians 1. You are reconciled, Romans 5. You now have mercy, 1 Peter 2. You have hope and peace, Ephesians 2. You are blameless, 1 Thessalonians 5. You are faultless, Jude 24. You are without spot or blemish, Ephesians 5. You are the beloved, 1 John 3. You are adopted, Romans 5. You are a friend, John 15. You are his favorite, John 15. You are redeemed, Titus. That's who you are. So how do you think about yourself when you wake up in the morning? What kind of thoughts do you have about yourself when you look in the mirror? I'm going to let you sit in it for a minute. How do you think about yourself? Because the Bible is clear. The Bible makes it plain. This is who you are because of him. Does that hold more weight than your feelings? Because a head-on collision with grace, grace is a person, his name is Jesus, and truth is a person, his name is Jesus. And he has revealed to us what the law came through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. Meaning when you have an encounter with him, you are having an encounter with truth. This is the ultimate truth. This has to dictate, come on, this has to dictate how you see yourself. I had a moment, I'll be, I have a real vulnerable moment with you. I'm on the plane headed to Finland, and you've probably never had this moment. You guys are way more secure than I am, but I'm flying on a plane. It was like 17 hours of travel, so I had a lot of time to think. And sometimes, left alone with our thoughts, if it's governed by the wrong thing, it's not always helpful. And I remember I was flying over, and I had this strange moment, and I just had this moment. I said, what am I doing? I don't know if you've ever had that moment. Like, I'm on a plane to Finland. There's going to be like over a thousand young people of this nation gathered and they're flying me over to preach. What do I have to say? What am I going to say to them? 
What do I have that's worth me traveling all the way across the world to say something of value to these people? I don't know. I have, what am I doing? And I started down this, like, this negative swirl, this kind of road of destruction internally, and all of a sudden I'm beating myself up. And then I have a moment, the Holy Spirit's like, hey, 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 what are you doing? I don't talk to you that way. Why do you talk to yourself that way? And all of a sudden I had to, internally, because of people on the plane, I had to kind of have this moment where I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm called. No, you called me. You told me I was going to be a missionary. You've anointed me to preach the gospel. I, ha- I do have something to say. Oh, I'm actually, I have a lot. I, I have more to say than I have time to say it. And I had to start speeching myself up in truth. you got to learn to preach to yourself. If you can't preach yourself up, you won't preach your room up. you got to learn. I'm telling you, when you're having that moment, you got to learn to preach the wildest sermons to yourself in the shower. When you get out and you look in the mirror, face to face, I've been called by God. I got angry last week, but guess what? I'm redeemed. I can change. See, you got to understand that change is possible. Look at, look at Saul's life. Destroyer of the church became builder of the church because he collided with grace on the road to Damascus. you got to understand that change is possible in your life, that you're not defeated. We often are like, oh, these are the cards I've been dealt. No, no, no. The cards you've been dealt is Jesus Christ and him crucified. On your behalf. you got to start preaching yourself up with the truth. It's not like positive thinking. No, it's truth. And it is positive. But it's better than positive. It's ultimate truth. It's transformative by nature. It actually changes you. It renews your mind. Because there is, listen, there is plenty of negative talk in the earth. Wouldn't it be amazing if the church refused to engage in that level of conversation and we decided to do what the Bible says and set your mind on things below. (sighs) Set your mind on things above where Christ is seated. You need that bird's eye view. You need that heavenly view that says "I'm, I'm going above the noise of culture. I'm rising above the second heaven's warfare level and I'm going throne room thoughts you got to learn to think from the throne. Change the way you think about God. Change the way you think about yourself. Here's number three. You ready? we got to change the way we think about others. But you got to, it starts with you. Because if you don't see you right, you won't see them right. Mark 12, 28 through 31. One of the scribes came up yourself there is no other commandment greater than neither slave nor free there is no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus what does that mean it means that in the kingdom we celebrate other cultures they don't divide it means that there is no societal ranking or class in the kingdom That just because you're male or female doesn't make you better or worse. In Christ, we are one, unified. All bets are off. There's a level playing field in him. Our identity is found in him. Therefore, we can celebrate our differences. We can celebrate our culture. We can celebrate our race. We can celebrate these things because in him, Jesus has torn down the wall of hostility and has built, created one new man. Ephesians 2, 13 through 22. Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace and who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, in him, one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, 
we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. You aren't just individually the temple of the Spirit. Collectively, we are the temple of the Spirit. In Him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Look at your neighbor and realize, look around, look around. All of us are being built together, built together to be a house, a dwelling place for the Lord in Orange County. No, no, seriously. God's saying collectively, I'm building you up as a dwelling place for my spirit in the earth. So we're, we're called to love our neighbor as ourself. But what about our enemy? What about those that we don't really enjoy being around? What about those who may be persecuted? What about those who mock us? What about those who reject us consistently? What does Jesus have to say about that? Can I tell you? Are you ready for it? Do you need to take a deep breath? I do. Oh, there we go. It feels better. Okay, Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You have, heard it, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good he sends rain on the just and on the unjust for if you love those who love you what reward do you have don't even the tax collectors do the same and if you greet only your brothers what more are you doing than others don't even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That line, pray for those who persecute you. Can you bless those who beat you down? Is your first response going directly to the Father and blessing them or going to your friend and calling that person out? we got to change the way we think. Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. Don't start a support group. Become an intercessor for your persecutor. It's okay to have friends and, you know, be good if someone throws a pie at you on the street. You know, tell your buddy. But maybe first go to the Father. Pie, that's silly. Okay, pray for those who persecute you. I'm going to quote John Stott here at length because I think, it's, I think it's really helpful to understand this. He's quoting Bonhoeffer here at first. He says, this is the supreme command, writes Bonhoeffer. Through the medium of prayer, we go to our enemy, stand by his side, and plead for him to God. I'm going to read that again. This is the supreme command that pray for those who persecute you. This is the supreme command. Through the medium of prayer, we are going to our enemy, standing by his side and pleading for him to God. Moreover, John Stott writes, if intercessory prayer is an expression of what love we have, it is a means to increase our love as well. It is impossible to pray for someone without loving him and impossible to go on praying for him without discovering that our love for him grows and matures. We must not, therefore, wait before praying for an enemy until we feel some kind of love for him in our heart. We must begin to pray for him before we are conscious of loving him. And we shall find our love uh, break first into a bud, then to a blossom. Jesus seems to have prayed for his tormentors actually while the iron spikes were being driven through his hands and feet. Check this out. Indeed, the imperfect tense of that, Father, forgive them, they know what they do. It suggests that he kept praying. 
he kept repeating his entreaty, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. It was the ongoing cry of his heart as he hung there. If the cruel torture of crucifixion could not silence our Lord's prayer for his enemies, what pain, pride, prejudice, or sloth could justify the silencing of ours? Matthew says, quotes Jesus, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's talking about becoming perfect in love. Come on, perfect in love, perfect in love. Don't you think Stephen's final words had such an impact on Paul? Don't you think that had to be going through his mind? They threw the clothes at his feet and he approved of the execution. And as he was standing there, as Stephen was dying, Lord, don't hold this sin against him. Don't you think that act of outrageous mercy had to haunt Saul? As he's there in the darkness, in that room, no food, no sight, replaying in his mind, Stephen was built different. That man was built different. He was just like his people. Don't you think he broke? Don't you think that was a catalyst for his grace and repentance? The apostle of grace, the one who preached mercy, the one who realized that Christ died for the ungodly. You go and you read Paul's writings and all of a sudden it starts making sense that he began to have a revelation of who this man on the tree truly was and he started rethinking who God is. And then he began to rethink who he is. And then he began to rethink who everyone else is. And then he became a church planter. Come on, the persecutor and destroyer of the church became the leading apostle and church planter. Don't tell me you can't change. Don't tell me God can't change you. Don't tell me that you can't overcome. Don't tell me that your friends are too far gone. Don't tell me your parents can't come to Christ. Don't tell me your aunt and uncle don't want to hear the gospel. He's the desire of every nation, America included. Change is possible. Change can happen. But we got to reevaluate a little bit. Because if Monday night just becomes a place where I got so encountered by God Monday night, but we live like the devil the rest of the week, what's the point? I'm not saying you live like the devil, but I'm saying the temptation is there. The world calls us to it. Culture is tempting us in every front. The world is speaking in all these different ways, and so we've got to have a moment where we say, my encounter with grace, my head-on collision with grace. If you haven't had one yet, you need to begin to pray, Lord, give me my road to Emmaus moment. Give me that collision, that Damascus moment. It may not be as dramatic as Paul's. It doesn't have to be. His was unique. Not every conversion story is that way. But you can experience the grace and the power of Jesus through this book. Through setting apart time in the morning and getting up and saying, Jesus, teach me through your grace. And all of a sudden what happens is the encounter on Monday night carries over into Tuesday. And then you love Monday night, but you love Tuesday morning alone with Jesus even more. you got to ask God for that type of hunger. Lord, I love our corporate. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep pouring out. We're going to go. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to get encountered. It's going to be amazing. But I can't wait for Tuesday morning when everyone else is asleep. And I can get up. And I can have a road to Emmaus journey. And you can come by your spirit and begin to teach me all the things concerning yourself through the scriptures and my eyes can get opened and all of a sudden my heart starts burning and then maybe before long you might have your own three-day fast moment where you're saying lord i don't want to eat anything but the scroll 
I just want you. I'm so hungry for revelation. I'm so hungry to be changed. Change the way I think. And then what happens is as the, you begin to change the way you think about God, yourself, and others, then guess what? Your decisions start changing. And then when your decisions are shaped by those thoughts about how good God is, your decisions are based off that, then guess what happens? Your actions change. Oh, those habits and those things you've been doing start breaking, not because you're trying harder, but because you're yielded. And your actions change and all of a sudden you start having a value that's different in your life. And then you start valuing things different. You have these core cultures in your life that Jesus lived become so important. And all of a sudden, before long, now it's your lifestyle. And you don't even have to think about it. Whereas before you really had to like be cautious in certain ways. And now it's just like, no, this is the life I live. This is how I live. This is why I don't let my eyes watch anything impure. It's not because I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just like, no, I just, my lifestyle, I just refuse to look. I have no desire for it because my thought life changed and my decisions changed and now my actions changed and now I have a value system that's otherworldly. It says my kingdom is what? Not of this world. It means it's, it's for this world, but it didn't originate here. It originated somewhere else, and I realized, oh, I'm born from above. You see, Jesus said if you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom. But when you're born again, that means your perspective changes. Everything begins to change, and now you're filtering everything through this man who came and revealed the Father. And all of a sudden, everything is different because you decided to rethink. And the Spirit makes you look just like Him. And then loving your enemies becomes easy. Forgiveness becomes the world you live in. You couldn't even imagine walking in unforgiveness. If you, were, if you walked in unforgiveness for an hour, you'd get so convicted. You're like, oh, no, you'd end up calling somebody. You'd call your friend, I've been, I've been holding bitterness for the last hour. And then your friend's like, I've been bitter for 10 years. What are you talking about? You start allowing the spirit to keep you on that tight leash because you love it. It doesn't become a burden, it becomes life. Oh, and the book becomes life, and you begin to realize, oh, these aren't limitations, this is freedom. You see, the world wants to tell you this is limiting you. This is keeping you in. That was Satan's temptation, Adam and Eve. God wants to limit you. No, he wants you to experience abundance in life. And he said, I'm going to put these limitations on you. The boundary lines are going to fall in pleasant places, and you're going to flourish in life. And then when you learn to forgive, bitterness is no longer the poison in your soul. It's the very life of the blood of the Lamb flowing through you. And all of a sudden, the world around you is shocked. Who are you? Oh, I had a head-on collision with grace. Let me tell you about it. You see, it changes everything. Don't let these nights be the only time you encounter Him. Let these nights be a catalyst. Let them be a supplement for you. But the bread is found in the closet. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, if you're thirsty, come to me. Come to me. If you're hungry, I'll feed you. He's the best chef. He is. He feeds the best meals. He knows exactly what will nourish your soul. More than any podcast, more than any TikTok account. No, it's true. I'm all for all of those, but not at the expense of getting alone with Him. Not at the expense of getting with the lover of my soul, sitting at His feet, listening to Him. Teach me, Jesus. And then your life will start looking like His. And guess what will happen? What would happen if all of us started living like Him on the daily in Orange County? You know that the Bible says, Joel prophesied, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Where do you think the spirit's going to be poured out from? Yielded believers. Doesn't the spirit of God live in you? Did he say, if you believe, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water? Could it be that the outpouring Orange County is looking for is coming through you? Come on. I believe it. 
So what we got to do, change the way we think about him. Change the way we think about ourselves. And change about everyone, how we view everyone else. The band can come up. Can you stand with me? I know as I'm saying this, some of you have things you're facing that are real challenges. You're, some of you are facing real challenges. You have real dynamics in your life, real hardships. And I'm not telling you to deny those problems. Those things are real. But what I'm telling you is what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26. With man, this is probably impossible. But with God, all things are possible. What Saul's story, Paul's story tells us is this. Change can happen. Change is possible. Change is possible. Mark 9, 23. All things are possible for one who believes. We have the slide for the, the scriptures, Romans 12, 9 through 20. We're going to put it up. See if it's okay. Um, I, want you to, I want you to get out, if you have a phone or a Bible. If you have a phone, probably a phone, because I want you to read this in a certain translation. If you have a phone, type in Romans 12, 9 through 21 in the Message Bible, Message Translation. Romans 12, 9 through 21 in the Message. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to get with uh, maybe one or two other people around you, small group, two or three people, maybe three. And I want you to read it out loud together. I want you to go ver just go around verse by verse, back and forth. And I want you to read Romans 12, 9 through 21 together. Here's what I want you to do. Then I want you to pray for each other. And I want you to ask the Lord to make this thing alive and make this the thing that you're living out on the daily. There's power in the scriptures. I want you to pray for each other. That it's what this, this scripture begin to renew the way you think and see the world around you and how you're called to live. So the band's gonna play. Do you guys have it? You guys got partners around you? All right, you guys go for it. Read it out loud, and then I want you to pray for it. We'll take a couple minutes here.
motivo. Once you've read the scriptures, I want you to pray for each other. Pray that this love would become real inside of you. Pray that your mind would be renewed by the Spirit. Can I get your attention real quick? If you're in the middle, just real quick, let me get your attention if you're in the middle of praying. That's okay. Here's one more thing I want to do before we jump into worship. I want you to stay in your groups. Let me get your attention real quick. Stay in your groups. Here's what I want you to do. If there's anywhere in your life, because point number two is you got to change the way you think about yourself. And what I want you to share, if there's any way, the question would be this, is there anywhere in my life I'm resisting what God has spoken about me? Is there anything in my life or my calling that I know the Lord has been saying to me or people have said it to me, I've been thinking about it, you have this longing for something, maybe it's that you felt you want to be a pastor one day or you want to be a missionary, you want to, you know, you want to be in the business sphere and produce wealth for the kingdom or you want to be a teacher or whatever it may be but you've been resistant in believing, I want you to share that with each other. I want you to pray for each other that that you would begin to accept what God has spoken about you, that you would accept your calling. Can we do that? And if you can't think of anything, if you're like, I don't know what the Lord said, then just share what deep in your heart you long to do that you're afraid of. Because chances are that's God. So I'm going to give you a couple moments. I want you just to go around, share quickly, and then just pray for each other that we would have the confidence and the faith to take God at his word over our life. Go for it.
As you guys are wrapping up, I want to invite you to come down to the front. We're going to worship. If you're still going, you can keep you can keep praying for each other. But we want to worship. I want to pray over you. If you guys want to come forward, we're going to worship a little bit longer. Seal this up. Many of you are still praying. It's amazing. If I can get, bring your prayers down. We want to do one corporate prayer together before we jump back into worship. If you want to bring it, we get your attention for a moment. We want to do a corporate sealing of this moment together. We're going to do a little repeat after me prayer. Does that sound good? I want you guys to say this with me. Say in Jesus' name. Say in Jesus' name. Tonight, we make the decision to let Jesus train our thoughts. We exchange every wrong view of God. And we look to Jesus. And we ask you, Jesus, reveal the Father in Jesus' name. Say this with me, say in Jesus' name. Tonight I stop resisting. I stop resisting what you're speaking over my life. And I choose to believe what you are speaking over me is true. I receive it by faith. Come on, I receive it by faith. In Jesus' name. Last one, in Jesus' name, we sign up for love. We sign up for mercy. We sign up for love, and we sign up for mercy. The mercy of Jesus. Come on. Come on, let's worship.
I'll be the incense, the sweetest fragrance. Only yours, consecrated for only you. Just feel more, cause I.
this out one more time to King Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us for today's live stream. We hope that you were blessed. We hope that you feel encouraged and you can find all these messages at circuitriders.tv. Make a free account today by clicking the link in the description. We'll see you next time.